My name is Gianfranco Pacchioni, and I have the pleasure to basically open this afternoon, which uh, would be a quite unusual kind of uh, meeting because we uh, plan to have uh, a first half which will be in English, so there will be a presentation by our speaker, I will be introduce the speaker, and then we will have a debate, and uh, since uh, we expect to have a fair number of people connected in streaming, the debate will be in Italian. But if somebody is here and he wants to uh, raise questions in English, that is of course uh, possible, so we will try to manage this double language. But this is also because we have a public from outside. So today we are talking of something that is really uh, something we hear almost every day. Because inter artificial intelligence is entering in our lives, is basically shaping our choices and our future. And uh, so we have many concerns and also many expectations about artificial intelligence. But today we will uh, have some, some, some way of thinking about this from a very uh, major person, it's uh, Professor Nello Cristianini. Nello Cristianini, uh, he studied in Trieste, and then he moved to, uh, to UK, and, uh, and he has been also in the United States. But he's, um, now he's professor at the University of Bath, after being professor at the University of Bristol. But what is really unique, that he started working in, with artificial intelligence more than 20 years ago, so when most of people didn't know what it is, uh, if it's really something which will become useful or interesting. So he has a great experience. Uh, he's still working on this topic, and we have an absolutely unusual aspect of his activity, that it is very broad, it's very diverse. He also speaks and, and interacts with sociologists, linguistics, and uh, uh, so people coming from completely different backgrounds, not only people developing algorithms, which is one of the major aspects of artificial intelligence. So I don't want to, 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 to take more time. Uh, I think and I hope uh, this will be an uh, exciting uh, afternoon. And I will pass the word to Nello for his uh, presentation about 20 minutes, something like that, which will provide ideas about what we are going to, do, to say today. I forgot to say a very important, an important thing that, well, this is also, in a way, the official launching of a book that he wrote, that you see here is uh, with a cryptic title, but we will explain why it is called La Scorciatoia, or the short, shortcut. There is also the English edition, which come, will come out shortly, more or less at the same time. And uh, I started reading this book, and I'm almost done, and it's really exciting and thinking, and plenty of think uh, useful thinking. And I also have to say that uh, for the debate, uh, we will uh, take profit of uh, Stefano Bertacchi, who is uh, uh, also a writer. He has written a few interesting books, and, and uh, to basically mostly about what he's working on, so biology, biotechnology. And, but he's mostly involved with social media, and he knows how to deal with young generations. So uh, he will basically uh, start the debate. With that, I would like to pass the word to Nello, and thank you for coming from, from UK today. Thank you very much, Gianfranco, and, uh, and thank you, Stefano, very much. And nice to meet you. And thank you for the invitation. Um, I was told that we speak in English today. I'll be happy to repeat things in Italian if somebody wants me to. And I will go slowly, I will try to speak slowly. Um, you have to speak closer to the mic. Yeah, and I think we have a, a short 20, maybe 30 minutes, max, because I have only one fundamental idea that I can convey in such a short time. So I pick one thing to convey from, from the book. And um, so don't ask me questions about <clears throat> GPT yet. I know it is in the newspapers, and if you read the newspapers, it seems that artificial intelligence just happened suddenly. A couple of years ago, it just exploded. And instead, it is the result of decades of decisions and choices and development. 
The point I want to make is that we can only understand what we can expect of it if we understand how we made it. If we don't understand the steps we took to get where we are today, we cannot anticipate what will happen next and we cannot regulate it by law. And we may be unsafe with it. The way to be safe with it is to know how it happened. And that's the story I will try to summarize today. How did we build what we built? That's it. So if we can have this single message clear at the end of the presentation, I'll be very happy. How we built what we built in a very general way. So this is Carl Sagan, the astronomer, when um, in the 70s, 1972, he was preparing his message to the extraterrestrial intelligence, the aliens that he felt perhaps, potentially, Pioneer 10 might encounter. Of course, Carl Sagan was way too smart to imagine that the probability of this Pioneer 10 meeting an alien was very, low, very, low. he knew it would be very low. But he was part of designing a long series of messages intended for alien intelligences. Very complicated. This is one where he's comparing our position in the solar system to the size of a hydrogen molecule to other parameters. And he felt that any form of intelligence should be able to decode it. He then designed an even more abstract message for the radio telescopes that was based on representing a molecule of formal data so that the aliens would know that the resonating frequency of that molecule should be the frequency to listen to the radio to. It was very abstract. He gave the messages to his PhD students in physics and they decoded it. He concluded it will work. So that was what intelligence was in his mind, the ability to do mathematics and physics. I tried to show this message to my own cat and the cat also evolved in our own universe following the same physical laws as Carl Sagan suggested. And he thought this is sufficient, being in the same universe with the same physical laws for enough time as we had, four billion years, should be sufficient to understand this message. Well, our cat still has not understood the message, has not shown any interest. And I suspect if you show this to any form of life, from the giant squid to the slug to the ant colony, they will not respond. Only one species. Yeah, I can. Only one species has shown any interest in these messages. Not even the humans, only the physicists and the mathematicians. So that is a, an important sign. What should we expect of intelligence? Because a number of tests made by philosophers and computer scientists for machines to be intelligent have similar features. So instead, I suspect that uh, there has been intelligence on this planet for much longer than there has been people and languages. Not only because we know nervous systems existed for much longer, brains existed for much longer, the slug and the snail were trying to eat your basil for a long time. But even the plant itself shows adaptive behavior in many ways. So we can use the general definition. Intelligence is that ability that allows an agent to pursue its objectives in a new situation, knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. So if you take this very simple perspective, you can look at uh, the mouse trying to get the food in a difficult situation, never seen before, has to work it out. Um, no need for language no need for consciousness, no need for introspection, culture. These are not necessary features. Actually, not even brains are required. In this image, there are two different agents. There is a plant manipulating a bee. There is a bee also making decisions too. They are both acting upon each other, two intelligent agents. One of them has no brain. So that's very clear. If we take this perspective, we can start imagining different things about our machines because the type of intelligence we have built first, this very first draft 
of machine intelligence. It has nothing to do with humans. We deal with it all the time. You open Amazon and you get recommendations of books. You open YouTube, you get 10 movie videos recommendations out of 10 billion. The amount of decision making is incredible and it's highly adaptive and highly goal driven. The kind of intelligence that is in YouTube is remarkable and effective and very different from yours. It is much closer to the very primitive intelligence of agents like a plant or an ant. So with this perspective, we can really start thinking in a different way about machine intelligence. The way we did it was by exploiting statistical relations in the data. We collect the data about the choices of users. We analyze them. We find statistical patterns. And we generalize from that. No need to understand much more than you need to understand. If your purpose is to make a good recommendation and to induce the user to click, that's all you need. Why would you want to do any more than that? That is how nature works, by the way. It does what it has to do. Um, there may be, in the future, different types of intelligence. Today, everything that is working today is statistical in nature. So how do we start? OK, here is a very important data point in our time story. One, Ada Lovelace. Anybody knows about Ada Lovelace here? Someone. Few people. Interestingly enough, mostly women. Because in fact, Ada Lovelace was, the, the, we call her the first programmer. Uh, it's one, one way to describe her work. Uh, the story is very long. I can't explain all of it, but it involves Italy. So look up her story or check it in chapter four. Um, it's a very interesting life, a remarkable life, and a remarkable story involving something that happened in Italy. But in the end of the day, she wrote a book about computing machines where she writes, this is 1843, by the way, where she writes, machines can only do what we know how to order them to do. So if the programmer doesn't know something, the machine cannot know that. The machine knows what the programmer knows. And that has been believed and kept us safe and comfortable for a long, long time. Until very few years ago, very near by from her home, home in London, the company DeepMind invented a program called um, AlphaGo that plays Go, and Alpha Zero that plays Go and chess and video games. And it can learn that from playing against itself billions of matches. No human intervention needed. The remarkable part is that no human can defeat the machine, not its programmers, not the world champion. And it was impossible to understand the reasons behind its decisions. Nobody can explain its moves. Here is a machine that knows something that its makers do not know. So this is not what Ada Lovelace expected. That was a remarkable moment. And when Demis Hassabis tried to explain why the machine works better in this way, he said, the machine is no longer constrained by the limits of human knowledge. That's important. We always are trained to believe that human knowledge is the highest form of knowledge, and the human brain is the highest form of brain. It is clearly not true, and there is no reason to expect that, not in evolution, not in any reason. Well, in this case, trying to be closer to humans would be a limitation to the machine. And modern AI can just be free from that limitation. That's quite a scary, chilling step that we are taking today. So how did we do that? So here is the question. Um, if all we want is for the machine to pursue its goals in a new unseen situation, well, reasoning is not necessary. And um, we took a series of shortcuts. The shortcuts are the theme of the book and the English version too. And, um, and I think we can go back time, but I, I want to be very quickly, you don't need me to make a list of people. But clearly, if you read the very first article where the word machine learning was first, the expression machine learning was first typed down, was in 1950, and Arthur Samuel was 
building a system to play checkers. And he said that uh, he wanted this to eliminate the need for programming. The machine can learn to play checkers without programming. Um, well, that is what happened. We can recommend the completion of a text, like in Google. We can recommend the next item you want to click on, like in YouTube, purely by learning from statistical patterns. The machine does not have a model of you, does not know what you are talking about, but it knows what you may want to say next. That is what we call a language model. A language model can uh, compute the probability of any linguistic sentence. A language model, by the way, is what powers GPT-3 or ChatGPT. That's why I put it here. It is just a larger language model. So this gentleman, Frederick Jelinek, was in charge of modeling language for IBM in the 80s. And he had a team of human experts in linguistics, grammar, to try and write down rules about how we think we can recognize a well-formed English sentence to remove the other ones. And the number of grammatical rules kept on growing and growing, and the system didn't improve. He had a large amount of knowledge of grammar, no benefits. One day he replaced the entire thing with statistical means. Those of you who do information theory, I hope many of you, will be familiar with uh, the model of the Shannon, the communication channel model. Well, that is what he employed. He's just assuming that the language is a message in a noisy channel and so on. So that's a beautiful piece of mathematics, very elegant. And by the way, the perfect way to solve it is by using Viterbi's algorithm. I like to mention Andrew Viterbi in this. So perfect, an algorithm that hasn't changed since the first time it was introduced. Anyway, and he came up with this quip. Every time I fire a linguist, our performance goes up. So he took data from real documents, computed the statistics of words and phrases, and used those to estimate the probability of any new sentence. He had uh, about 10,000 parameters to tune, to infer to, from the data. Today, ChatGPT has 175 billion parameters, but it is tuned much like that system from a large corpus of documents, except that today, ChatGPT is trained on every single document on the web. Wikipedia, every single book ever digitized, every page ever written, every discussion, Reddit, Quora, all of it. And even that is not enough to fully train it. If we had more data, we could train it further. We know from the learning curves of GPT-3 that it has not reached saturation. If you give us more data, it will go up. But it all started with this decision, which was the first shortcut. The problem was, who is going to give you good data? And that's the problem we're going to address. Data is expensive, but um, you can see that you can know what to do without knowing why. That's quite a step. This actually is asking a question about what is the role of theory in science. If you know what to do, if you know how the protein will fold, if you know how the molecule will behave, you don't need to know why in, that idea, in this perspective. So why do you want a theory? It's a very big question we're going to have to face very soon about philosophy of science. So this is a person I know, and he's called Vapnik, and he's been a very influential thinker in statistical learning theory. And one of the things he liked to repeat a lot when I was a student in the late 90s, I heard him quite a few occasions repeating this sentence. If you are solving a problem in science, do not solve the more general problem, just as an intermediate step. Solve the problem you need, not the more general one. Translation, if you're trying to stop spam emails, focus on stopping spam emails. Why do you want to understand the nature of language? If you're trying to sell books, just focus on selling books. Why do you want to understand the literary criticism and the psychology of readers? That was the philosophy. Do what you need to do because the entire field was getting stuck in very large questions. And nobody was coming back. People were just leaving towards this journey, this 
about we want to know the nature of intelligence. And nobody was coming back. They started taking shortcuts. One shortcut was, why should I pay to make high quality data? You know, when you want to know how well a vaccine works, you, you, you select 60,000 people, you split them in two, you give them some vaccine to half of them, a placebo to the others, you spend money. You do medical checks, you know. This time there was an app to follow them. But there is money to make data. Well, one shortcut has been to just grab whatever data you find sitting around on the web. Don't ask questions, get the data. That's cheap. And now we have two data, two shortcuts. Don't do theories, do statistics. Don't make data, just harvest data from the wild. You still don't know what the human user wants to do. You could ask them in a questionnaire, was this video okay? Was this book nice to you? But you know they will not do it. People will not do it. So you make a third shortcut. You just watch them. You just watch them. And then if they click on a video, you will assume they like it. It's an assumption. It's a third shortcut. It's called implicit feedback. But what does this create? It creates a system, a web system, that is constantly watching you, constantly suggesting new options just to see what you do. It is exploring you. In the business of machine learning, we have two words we use all the time, exploration and exploitation. In order to exploit the user, you must explore them first. So you explore and exploit at the same time. You see what they do, and you try to find whatever makes them click the most. That is what YouTube does, finding what makes you click individually. No understanding of why. So there is one more slogan. This is the typical Generation Z researcher of these days that I meet in my university. They will happily say, intelligence begins at one billion examples. That is now sunk in the imagination of the students. They come in assuming at some point they will need one billion examples. You wouldn't know how absurd this would have sounded to me when I was a student. There would be no way I would have believed it. One billion is an okay proposition because the machines we have and the algorithms we made are so efficient and the data is so plentiful. We can get text and images and video and we can train machines on one billion examples. So when you put together all of this, you have something that is quite effective, in many ways superhuman, in some other ways very unlike humans, and we shouldn't really try to think of it as a human mind with language and introspection and self-awareness. It would be crazy. It is a just a different type of thing. And here is the problem that you need to remember, really one message. It is very hard to imagine an alien form of intelligence. Even Carl Sagan, the great astronomer, failed. We cannot easily imagine aliens. Something very, very other than us is difficult. The machine we built is fundamentally different than us, and we feel the need to make it in an anthropomorphic way. We visualize it with a face and a body and language. And now GPT came up, not much more clever than YouTube recommendation algorithm, but this one speaks, and suddenly, everybody is taking notice. You had Facebook in your pocket for years, and nobody was panicking. Now a similar algorithm with similar methods speaks. And now we are taking notice, because that is how we are. So Vapnik had a nice, nice way to explain his philosophy, whether you like it or not. He said, Einstein is famous for saying, I want to know God's thoughts, the essence of the true final theory. That is what Einstein wanted. And Vapnik liked to say, I just want to know how to act well without understanding God's thoughts. You understand? We don't need to find the truth. This is Vapnik's position. We just need to make good decisions. And that summarizes all the shortcuts that we made. They took us where we are today. Not only have we got our first type of intelligence after decades of work, we have already deployed it 
quite in a central position. It makes decisions for us. It makes decisions that affect us. And we don't understand fully what it is thinking because it is not thinking in a human way. As they say sarcastically in England, what could possibly go wrong? Except possibly is pronounced sarcastically. And that's what we find right now. Surveillance, fears, fear of addiction, fear of biased decisions, fears of manipulations, and so on. We actually don't know. I took a long time to fact check all of these claims. It is not so clear that it is actually happening in the way the media is reporting it. The best I can do as a scientist, I reported in three specific chapters of the book, the best studies I could find. Some suggest that this is going on, that we can be manipulated and persuaded and potentially being addicted. Some other studies haven't concluded that. And we are still in the middle. And all I can say as a scientist is, let's find out because uh, how can you leave your children in front of something and you just don't know the effects of that. But we don't know. The tool is we just have a lot of concerns. So the discussion I would like to have is, what is the role of theory in science, given all that we are building? Can machines become smarter than humans? How do we regulate them by law? Are there any risks of persuasion and polarization as we fear and we hear? What can we expect after GPT? I think understanding how we built this version of AI will help us understand the divergent questions. So I hope you will enjoy this um, conversation today. Thank you very much. Grazie mille al professor Cristianini per uh, questo intervento molto, molto interessante. Uh, ora apriamo una discussione uh, insieme, ricordo anche a chi è collegato da casa che può fare delle domande in chat, io qui le sto guardando, le solo io ho l'intelligenza artificiale che controlla. Se qualcuno in sala, sì? vuole, sen se qualcuno in sala vuole sentire una versione inglese rapida, abbreviata delle risposte e sarà mio piacere riassumere. Certo, ok. Is Però forse any, meglio dire in inglese. Is there anybody in the room who would like a short summary in English of the answers? One, two. Ok. It would so, be my pleasure. So in case we can have a translation of the question and the reply from Professor Cristianini. Um, so I will have a hybrid uh, uh, situation. Um, vorrei iniziare con uh, un, proprio leggere un breve, un breve passo del libro che secondo me è, è interessante anche per la conclusione che ha fatto il professore um, dal capitolo 8 il difetto uh, al momento in cui scriviamo nel 2022 il numero di utenti quotidiani di questi strumenti quelli dell'intelligenza artificiale in generale è oltre 3 miliardi e ancora non abbiamo informazioni conclusive sui loro effetti a lungo termine su individui vulnerabili. Mentre sono disposto a credere che il livello di ansia mostrato dai media a tal proposito sia esagerato, dovremmo comunque studiare gli effetti sulle persone e sulla società che possono derivare da questa interazione, così come ci aspetteremmo da qualsiasi altro settore industriale. Fortunatamente stiamo iniziando a muoverci in questa direzione. Adesso questo è tratto dal sottocapitolo quello che mi toglie il sonno e secondo me queste è, è, sono delle parole molto interessanti che io non posso che condividere vedendolo per esempio dal punto di vista della mia ricerca nell'ambito delle biotecnologie dove insomma, modificazione genetica eccetera eccetera in tanti hanno questi timori. Eh, quindi mh, puoi esplicitare questo concetto di ciò che non ti lascia dormire la notte, ciò che ti toglie il sonno. Sì. I, they, uh, I will explain what keeps me up at night. I will do it in Italian, and then I will do it in English. Briefly. It is not very... I will make it sound longer than it is in Italian, but it's really short. Um, quello che... Sì, sempre a micro ragazzi. <laughs> Ci sono molte cose che sinceramente... Io, io non è che voglio cambiare il mondo, onestamente. Non sono uno di quelli che vuole creare la giustizia infinita. A me basta sapere che non faccio del male a qualcuno, che seguiamo le leggi e voglio dormire la notte in pace. Onestamente, il mio obiettivo è fare il mio lavoro di, di, di informatico 
senza creare problemi. Questo è. Ma ogni tanto bisogna fermarsi. E io so quando bisogna fermarsi, perché l'ho imparato dai miei insegnanti a Trieste, specialmente un paio di loro che avevano il carattere giusto. E l'idea era, se tu fai qualcosa che può andare a finire veramente male, controlla se è già illegale, va bene, se invece è ancora legale, avvisa qualcuno che ci pensi in loro. Qualcuno deve fare le leggi. Ecco, in questo momento quello che noi facciamo legalmente può fare del male alle persone e io personalmente mi preferisco fermarmi un momentino. Diamo tempo alla legge di aggiornarsi. Ecco, questo è il primo concetto. Cioè, what keeps me up at night? My main concern is not to harm. Do not harm. And if I see something I do can lead to harm, I should stop until the laws catch up. The laws are catching up right now, but they are not quite ready yet. So that's my concern. Allora, cosa può succedere? Ci sono dei casi allarmanti. C'è un caso di una ragazzina inglese che si chiama Molly Russell, che si è tolta la vita purtroppo dopo un periodo di depressione, avendo passato moltissime ore in presenza di social media e guidati da raccomandatori di ricerca. E in quel caso, per la prima volta, il coroner ha scritto nel report che le cause della morte, fra le cause della morte, un contributo è stato l'algoritmo che proponeva contenuti nocivi senza la richiesta del, della ragazzina. Ecco, questo è un caso in cui il coroner ha scritto questa frase nel suo report. There was one case in the United Kingdom where a young girl called Molly Russell took her life sadly after a period of depression but also after having um, spent a long time in the presence of social media. The coroner report for the very first time last year reported that among the causes of her death, one was the algorithm, one cause of death. She was a vulnerable child already because of depression, but one cause of death was that the algorithm presented her with harmful content without her request. So that's the first time I hear a legal argument ruling that. Molly Russell case, 2022. Questa è la prima volta che sento un caso del genere. Ci sono altri casi sospettati, ma non dimostrati da una corte, da un giudice. Eh, ci sono i famosi casi dei whistleblowers, gente che lascia la compagnia e, e porta via dei documenti, che suggeriscono fortemente che ci sono potenzialmente dei problemi. Io non li ho dimostrati, non ho visto le prove, non posso farci niente, posso solamente dire è il momento di rallentare, per quanto mi riguarda, e assicurarci che non facciamo del male a nessuno. Certo. I don't have any evidence, even from the Facebook whistleblower leaks, I can't say anything other than it is time to know. Capito? Quindi ci sono però dei casi. È il caso del videogioco che ho menzionato nel capitolo Q 8. Hubert. Eh sì, è un esempio che adesso è un po' lungo da spiegare, ma è capito. Che chi conosce Qbert in questa stanza? Ok, quindi adesso giochiamo a Qbert. Ce l'hai? No. <ride> Cosa? Ale... No, credevo che ce l'avessi veramente. No, no, non sono ah. così preparato. <ride> ma anch'io non ci ho giocato, non sono sufficientemente... Era della generazione prima della mia. Mi spiace. Va bene, comunque c'è una storia un po' lunga, adesso è meglio che voi leggiate, ma... È... Ormai è normale eh, misurare la capacità dei vostri algoritmi di apprendimento collegandoli a una piattaforma di videogiochi e lasciando che imparino a giocare. I, i, gli algoritmi nuovi e recenti possono imparare a giocare 50 videogiochi senza supervisione in tempi brevissimi e diventare campioni. Tra questi, e sfruttano qualunque cosa, loro gli basta di avere un punteggio alto, non è che sanno cosa fanno. A noi c'è una narrativa, c'è Pac-Man nel, nel labirinto, c'è i Space Invaders che vengono giù dallo spazio, abbiamo una, una storia nella nostra testa. Per la macchina non c'è niente. La macchina vede le luci e fa i punti, pigiando il bottone. In uno di questi giochi, in uno di questi algoritmi, la macchina ha imparato un trucco per fare milioni di punti a un gioco che si chiamava Qbert. E li ha fatti in modo interamente irrazionale, saltando in un precipizio, senza motivo, senza logica, perché c'era un un difetto nel software, un bug nel software, e la macchina l'ha scoperto e sfruttato. Perché no? Quello che prendeva un difetto per la macchina è una caratteristica dell'ambiente da sfruttare. Ecco, questo 
Questo è quello quando l'ho letto? No, domi. Perché il cervello umano ha anche esso i suoi difetti, che la macchina può scoprire. In English, the machine can now learn to play video games. We can interface the algorithm to the machine, to the video game. And we know we can learn 50 video games very, very well, automatically. No supervision, just increasing the score. In one such experiment, the machine performed very well in most games, but performed exceptionally well in one, called the Cube Lab. In that case, after inspection, it was found the machine finds and exploits a very irrational behavior where the little character plunges into a precipice. And that's because there was a software bug, a programming de defect in the 70s that nobody knew about. The machine discovered it and exploited it. We think it's a mistake because it doesn't fit in the narrative of the character of the game. For the machine, it is just a feature of the environment which is proper to exploit. That night, I actually did not sleep for real because uh, that is indeed what I think I think human brains might have also a number of bugs that can be exploited that we don't know about. Okay. Um, mi aggancio un altro grande tema che viene affrontato nel libro eh, con un aneddoto personale quando appunto avevo iniziato l'università biotecnologie eh, il social principale era facebook okay? instagram non c'era ancora e quando sono iniziate ad apparirmi le pubblicità delle aziende non so dei sequenziamenti del dna o che vendevano i, so, gli oggetti di plastica del laboratorio eh, pensavo sto, sto iniziando a diventare uno scienziato proprio che è ridicolo come cosa ma ai tempi come studente magari uno lo pensa perché? perché inizia a mettere mi piace alle pagine legate al mondo della scienza e della ricerca quindi ricordo che c'era anche tra i miei compagni di corso questa eccitazione di sentirsi un po' quasi eh, gli pseudo ricercatori perché ti arrivavano questi annunci di cui ovviamente non te ne potevi fare niente eh, in quel momento eh, ovviamente è legato questo al mondo dei messaggi personalizzati di cui eh, tu parli a lungo eh, nel libro eh, che sono sempre, diciamo, eh, mi fanno sempre pensare sia agli aspetti positivi che agli aspetti negativi come ti ho detto, da un lato l'aspetto negativo ovviamente per esempio per chi con me si occupa anche di divulgazione scientifica social si vengono a creare cosiddette eco chambers di cui tu parli cioè riuscire a eh, veicolare informazioni corrette sui so, i vaccini, cosa in cui siamo ritrovati su una pandemia, all'interno di una bolla che è già fortemente contraria ai vaccini è difficile, perché? Perché il social continuerà a darti i contenuti che tu vorrai Dall'altro però è anche comodo, nel senso che ti, ti arrivano dei contenuti che sono effettivamente quelli che ti possono essere utili perché matchano con le tue, eh, con le tue esigenze, i tuoi bisogni, eccetera, eccetera. Quindi anche a me effettivamente in alcuni casi sono stati utili trovare degli annunci di questo tipo. Quindi come, come affronti questo tema sia nel libro che nella ricerca quando parli di questi aspetti, di questa bilancia tra i due eh, fuochi dei messaggi personalizzati? So the general question I will answer later is about there is the good side and the bad side of all this. È meglio che o parliamo tutto inglese. Ah, solo per i due. Eh, ma allora tutti parlano in inglese, quindi o lo facciamo tutto in inglese. Un'altra cosa, se può togliere la presentazione così si vede la copertina del libro. più. O anche la proiezione del foglio. Okay, so my question is related to my what happened when I was a student that uh, it started to popping out in social media advertises of, uh, I don't know, sequencing uh, uh, or uh, DNA technique industries uh, that are, of course, related to the topic of biotechnology that I'm with it with. And I remember that uh, together with my uh, course mates, we were excited about that because it felt like we were becoming real scientists because we were exposed to that kind of advertise. But thinking about um, afterwards, it's clear that there's this topic of uh, directed uh, um, advertises. Um, and from one side, of course, uh, this a bad thing because uh, it, it's a problem with people like to me, for me that I'm dealing with science communication when you're trying to go beyond your bubble and trying to talk with people, I don't know, people that don't believe in vaccines uh, 
or this kind of stuff uh, that were of course important during the pandemic to do uh, and on the other side it's good because it's useful because it provides you some uh, insight on things that you like or you would be you interested in to uh, see and it happened to me that really suggested me very interesting insightful stuff so my question for uh, for Nello was related how to balance when dealing with this topic these two these two edges We just decided that we just speak in English. No, it doesn't make sense that we do uh, okay, translation yeah. for every. I think everybody speaks English, and uh, either we stay in Italian or we do it in English, not by, with the translation, otherwise everything okay, okay. double. So, okay. okay, I'm downloading Google Translator in my mind right now. <laughs> let's just keep, let's try to keep everything very quick. I will try to keep my answer short. Let's keep everything short. Yep. So, how do you balance? I think we must just I'll be very quick. I really believe. There is a lot of good in what we are doing. I wouldn't be spending the last 25 years. I really believe there is a lot of good. We can't stop, but there is risk. How do you balance it? Um, the wrong answer is to stop entirely what we're doing. The right answer is to regulate it, Stefano, and to understand it and make the right laws. We've been here before with medicines, with chemicals, with everything. Um, when something is new, we need to learn how to deal with it. This happened very fast. We are going to learn how to deal with it. Okay. So is there any question from the audience or from live stream? I don't see any question here. Is there someone willing to break the ice? Okay, In the front row, please, thank you. Okay, you mentioned just uh, physical harm, uh, but what about other forms of harm that affect not just individuals but societies, like uh, effect on privacy, autonomy, and stuff like this? Yeah, there is so much that we don't know. If we had a complete list of what we must look out for, we would probably solve it easily. We keep on discovering different unexpected problems. That's the truth. And something that we are discovering now is um, social harm, inequality, potentially, that could be in case, um, polarization, and so on. And you know what we noticed, a pattern, that a lot of these problems happen in the interface between different cultures. There shouldn't be, but we do have different scientific domains. So when we interface an algorithm, statistical algorithm, with the public opinion, which is the domain of the social sciences, we don't know. It's much harder for us. We don't even know how social public opinion forms. We don't know very well how the media content shapes public opinion. I spent ages reading, actually, the literature of the social scientists about television and newspapers. I know work on what is called cultivation theory, how the choice of television channel can shape your beliefs. I know about newspapers. But that is an intersection that we never thought we would explore. When you study software engineering or statistical machine learning, you never think you have to deal with that. So yes, there could be. Or there is probably some effect on society that we still have to work out. And that's part of the things we need to do quite fast, I suppose. And this is why we need the help of different types of people, by the way. And by the way, backtracking, that is where I found my problem. I could not have a productive collaboration with colleagues because often their idea of artificial intelligence was based on science fiction. Hmm. I kept on hearing the same questions. I couldn't work. I thought we have to frame the conversation in a more productive way. The result of that effort is this book, framing the conversation in a way that you can engage our colleagues from the humanities and social sciences. That is there. Someone else? Okay. I'm, I'm not sure it's needed, the microphone, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah for people uh, from home. Oh, right. So you said that 
uh, in developing these technologies would be important just to stop and reflect on what we are doing. But my doubt is, is it actually possible to stop? So um, I, for example, envision this scenario. So we can stop and reflect and make laws about how to develop and use this technology, but will other countries follow our laws? So I'm just hypothesizing the Chinese, okay? So we can stop and maybe they can go on developing this technology in an illiberal and undemocratic society. So is it actually possible? Wouldn't it be riskier to stop in that case? Yes, it's very, very, that is why this is a problem. It wouldn't be a problem if this consideration wasn't true. So I found a, a friendlier way to frame it, but the sentiment is the same. Imagine two companies, and one company is using vast scale automation and AI in dealing with their online customers. The other one is taking a break and studying carefully every single ethical implication, which they are operating on the same market. Can the second company operate? when the competitor is doing this. Now, in a country, it's interesting, it's a game theory question, it's a Nash equilibrium question, many different companies would love to stop. But so long as one of them doesn't cooperate, they're all going to lose out. In a country, the government can make a law. For example, everybody puts uh, filters in the chimneys. Any chemical plant in the country has to spend money to put a purifier or a filter, expensive as it is, on the chemical plant. Everybody has the same market, the same conditions. If it was enforced by law, the virtuous ones would lose money and the less virtuous ones would dominate the market. So in a country, we can make a law. How about in a world where there is not a central government? Maybe one side of the world can do it, and the other side will not do it. And now they're operating in the same market, and now they are not regulating data, privacy, and so on. That's an enormous dilemma. However, politicians have seen this before. Many of the problems that we find are not new. Don't think that a bunch of computer scientists, as smart as they think they are, can solve this. This has happened for a long time, and there are solutions. For example, the European Union is a very large and very wealthy block of 500 million wealthy customers that can be regulated in a central way. That has always been a good way to set standards. Foreign companies to operate in this market will have to adopt the same rules, exactly the same rules. Other countries will follow suit. Those who produce their software to be European compatible, at that point will have it. And their country can demand also to follow the same rules because it will be made. So Europe can be the standard setter. I really think it can be. And Europe is approving very soon the AI Act, which is designed to be the first step in regulating this technology. This will create a cascade. Of course, we can't force other countries to do the same. But if they want to operate in this look uh, lucrative market, yes, we can. And that is how you start. Uh, on this, I have a question uh, regarding the fact that are um, policymakers and politicians uh, ready to legislate on this topic in terms of knowledge of the topic itself? Well, what do you I, think? I, I had mixed reports to make. I found uh, more than I expected because my expectations were low, and I found actually quite a few politicians that have the right advisors. So there are good advisors around... But here in the UK? In Europe. In Europe, okay, in general. In Italy, it doesn't matter. The laws are made in Brussels for this kind of domains. Okay, okay. So you find the right advisors around the politicians. That is fortunately the case. Whether the politicians understand it, it's, it's a different story. But uh, often it, they get their information from the media. The media, unfortunately, is still catching up. Um, but, um, of course, uh, politicians have an interesting job because they don't just listen to us. They listen also to the industry. So there is a, a tension, fundamental tension. Again, nothing new. They know how to handle the tension. There is industry who wants as little regulation as possible. 
there is a society who needs regulation. There are so many needs. They are in the middle, but they were in the middle for a long time. They choose to be there. That's their life. So do not despair. What we should do, at least, is to explain. Because the one thing we don't want is some philosopher or some other, you know, whatever, with good intentions, keeping talking about a type of AI that never existed. And that is what we can avoid. These are not logical machines. You can't reason with them. You can't demand an explanation from them. You can't convince them of anything. They don't care. They don't even hate us. They don't love us. They are indifferent statistical mechanisms. But they are enormous. And they have a superhuman power. So you think in this way, you don't ask stupid questions anymore, like can machines fall in love or stuff like this, because it doesn't apply. So the first thing to do, let us think about them in the right way. Let us not tolerate you know, too many opinions for people who shouldn't have them. But it is not the politicians, often it's the academics as well. So we are not innocent. Yeah, well. And of course, this book is an excellent example on how to disseminate the topic of uh, uh, artificial intelligence to, towards all the layers of the society. I think it was really interesting to, to me that I'm scientist in another field that somehow it could be related, could exploit uh, artificial intelligence to power up level up, uh, talking about uh, video games, uh, uh, the knowledge of life sciences, uh, but of course it would be really helpful for people uh, uh, interested in general in science, but to common people, because they need to be correctly informed on this topic as well, and politicians, so I hope that many politicians might have this book in their hands, because it will be really insightful and interesting. So is there any question? This is a question from from the live, okay, I'm reading it. Uh, what are the policies, okay, Mariella Berra writes, what are the policies of the European Union towards the so-called XAI and how to be able to verify that the predictions are the most probabilistically accurate? I suppose she means explainable AI, right? By okay, it's X. AI. Yeah, I suppose they mean explainable AI. So there is, in the GDPR law, a provision that a data subject is entitled to an, um, an explanation for a decision. So my machine decides that you don't get a mortgage. Why? You should ask. In one part of the GDPR, you are entitled to an explanation of the decision. In a different part, you are entitled to know the logic of the mechanism, which is a very different concept legally. So we don't know. But the point is, because of that, there is attention to the notion of explainable AI. Now, I can be blunt or not. I'll be not. I'll be, I'll be polite. But of course, um, you hear a lot of interesting philosophical arguments. What is really an explanation? Also in science, you know, why does this fall down when it falls? First, it is not easy to define what an explanation is. People are known to make decisions before they know why. We often cook up an explanation after we see what decision we made. This is known. We know a lot of things. We know that explanations aren't easy, but there is an effort to make explainable AI. So we discussed a lot. What, what is the least, the minimum? And there are some minimum requirements, at least. It wouldn't be a full explanation of why the machine did it. But you can ask something like, what should I have done different? Or what could I have done different in my mortgage application? If I only changed my income, would I get it? If I only... So you can try and work out a compromise. But the fully fledged explanation in terms of, I did this because I believe this and that, and therefore I made this decision, we have not built a machine that can do that. And those that can do that are just not useful enough to do anything useful. So we are facing this problem. So how do you inspect a black box? As I said, the chat GPT has 175 billion floating point numbers as parameters. How do you inspect if in that tangle there is a slightly sexist belief about applicants? Maybe there is, maybe there is, we just don't know. So one option is stress test, 
you, you create a, a way of testing these things, standardized, not an explanation, but something. Another one, you only allow certain types of systems that are explainable in certain domains, but I don't see them working close to what we do have. Um, the mean thing of me, I will not say, but of course there are many colleagues who were working in the previous incarnations of AI, which never really did deliver, and for them that is an opportunity. So they'd like to talk about it. I want to see examples. I haven't seen actual, effective, scalable, comparable, recommended systems for Netflix. Okay. That, is, that are explainable on okay. that scale. I haven't seen it. For sure, the media will be delighted with something about Netflix. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you were mentioning uh, philosophy. Uh, I was checking uh, the page of your book on Amazon. So as a start, to, to see which were the books recommended, uh, since we were talking about it. As a start, congratulations, because your book is uh, 325th in all the books in Italy. It just came out last week. Yeah, I, okay. Maybe you... Your bots uh, are yeah, very good. Because the Molino only expects first place. Yeah, so, no, but you already but have a three. We have, been, we have been only three votes, five stars. Okay, your algorithm worked very well. Um, someone is cheating. No, I'm sorry, I'm joking, of course. But it's interesting because on the suggested uh, books, I mean, uh, the books that were bought by someone that bought this book, the second one is uh, um, Intercom Hegel, it's about Hegel philosophy. So it's interesting because here, uh, no, it's, it's wrong. Here. Yeah. 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 Two, two, two. So there's really a connection with, with philosophy. Yes? Well, give it time. Are there your recommendation or people? No, no, people who. No. You, you, you might be really right. Okay. okay. I'm logged with my uh, login, but. Uh, all of the other books are related to well, uh, artificial intelligence. Well, I, I so. don't know if you're right, but if you're right, I'm really happy. My ambition uh, it's not is... Uh, no, it's because not, uh, the computer there. scientists in the room, they know this stuff better than me already. They don't need to, to read it. Everyone else needs to know it, and philosophers are the, one of, of my targets. So I'm pleased uh, if you find the correlation. Yeah, it's okay, it's your work. Not very but, but, but I mean, you are 10th in uh, uh, cultural, social and cultural studies. I'm really jealous, I must say. Uh, um, no, my, so then my question was in your research, uh, have you ever tried uh, to work with philosoph philosophers? Very or? much, very much. I, have, uh, I am blessed. I met some very interesting philosophers in, in, in my work. I actually published in, in philosophy journals. Okay. I, have a secret, I, have, <laughs> I have a secret page on uh, Phil Papers, which is a, a repository. We are live on YouTube. Uh, now the algorithm knows that you have this. Phil Papers, yeah. Phil Sorry. Papers, I like that. Yes, um, um, th there are different types, like, like in science, also philosophy. Yes, I've tried. Language okay. is a challenge. Communication is a challenge. I found that using the simplest possible words keeps you honest. And talking to very different people keeps you honest. So that is actually one thing, talking to okay. philosophers. Nice. And we are happy that today we managed to talk with a lot of different people. If there's any other question from here or from the audience at home? Yeah, please. I, I have a question which is maybe a little bit more technical, but in particular when artificial intelligence is used in science, I mean, to deduce general trends and so on. Let's think of, I don't know, a drug which cures a given disease. <clears throat> of course, you have a plenty of data, but very often this data may also be contradictory. I mean, some studies may say, well, this works very well. Some say, well, this doesn't work so well. <clears throat> some say, this doesn't work at all. And of course, there are, there are various reasons. Maybe the experiments are done in different ways. Maybe um, the drug has been synthesized in different ways. Uh, so the quality of the research may be different. So the question is, uh, how important is the quality of the data? And how important is denoising the data if you want to have uh, accurate predictions or accurate patterns? Yeah, that's a very important question. And I would add one more level. Science is difficult enough because of noise but we don't assume adversaries. In the real world, we have the noise and the adversaries to handle at the same time. 
So that's the big question. Um, the current systems, you can imagine, they don't run scientific experiments, although there are many interesting projects underway for science, but imagine just recommending a movie on Netflix. It is an experiment. You have a lot of noisy data, conflicting data, different people with different things. Mistakes are made. People change their mind. Different families use the same account. Can you imagine the amount of noise? This is where the statistical method works because it, it finds stable, strong statistical patterns and it can handle contradiction better than any other method we know. Sorry, but if the majority of scientists are doing the wrong thing, that doesn't mean it is right. If you may was... have a set of data where you deny and because you have a larger number of people saying the wrong thing. In science, it's enough. I mean, it's not a majority who is right. Yeah, but we don't do opinion polls. We, I'm talking about experiments here. So I, thought, I, thought your noise, I thought your noise and your data were experimental noise and experimental data. Well, then nature is nature. So you can, uh, you can run... Uh, you can run a mass screening with a machine. Actually, in the case of, of, of combinatorial chemistry, we actually do that. There are mass screenings by robots. Yeah, you get noisy data, but the large numbers work. Um, adversaries can be handled. It's very tricky here. You can design a way to collect your data, exploiting a beautiful discipline, scary, violent part of mathematics called mechanism design. It is the dark side of game theory. It is how you design a game to force the players to do what you want. And uh, a good example is the auction, eBay. All of you want to get the lowest possible price, but I want to find the one of you who is prepared to pay the most and how much you're prepared to pay. You design the, the interaction in such a way that there is no way for you to bid without revealing information every time until you disclose all the information I need. That is an example of a market mechanism. There are other mechanisms, and there is a science of designing mechanisms. They can elicit data in the presence of noise and other sites, but it takes some care. Google had this problem. For a long time, Google was ranking pages to avoid spammers, and people realized that they can make keywords in the pages and get their page top. So Google decided to use the text of pages linking to a page as a good, reliable descriptor of this page. And that is because it's harder to convince and coordinate other people. But, of course, a lot of young people got together and they decided to link to the page of the President Bush with some unflattering words. And after that, searching for those words would deliver Bush right away. So Google developed a series of systems, one after the other, to make it very, very difficult for this coordination to ever happen again. So we can handle noise and adversarial attacks. Okay, so is there any question from, from the audience or from home? Otherwise, we might go to the end of the, the conference. So thank you, thank you so much, Professor uh, Cassianini, for uh, being here from the UK for the first uh, Italian presentation of your book that just came out, despite being so high in the, in the list. Thank you. There's two comments, very nice. Uh, look at them. They were right with uh, chat GPT, of course. Uh, so thanks a lot. Of course, Professor will be here for uh, any further questions. Uh, right. And uh, so thanks a lot for being here. Grazie. Grazie.